Well, good morning to everyone, and uh, welcome to Prime Time at the BU Library. Prime Time celebrates the learning beyond the classroom of Bethel faculty, students, and staff, and it's a collaborative project between the Friends of the BU Library, faculty development, and other offices on campus. If you enjoy Prime Time programming, please consider becoming a member of the Friends of the Library. More information is available on the library website, where you can also find archive, archived recordings of most prime time presentations in the BU Digital Library. Join us on Thursday, March 29th at 11.15, when Rachel Land, junior social studies major, shares about her time studying abroad in Uganda. Today we welcome Dr. Nancy Bruley, professor of communication studies, as she discusses adolescent to parent abuse focusing on the disenfranchised grief that many abused parents experience over the loss of a normal family experience while raising their abusive teen. Let's welcome Nancy. Thank you. Well, I've been teaching since 7, I, 7.30 this morning, so I feel like my day is almost over with something. My voice is already good. Um, this is, uh, if you notice here, it says not quite ready for prime time. Um, normally I wait to the last minute before I present at a conference. And so I thought this time I would force myself to prepare, and I was so glad I did because um, I've been debating, the last time I had talked in the, in the prime time, I had, I had mentioned the fact that I was debating between um, exploring ambiguous loss that parents are experiencing or, or disenfranchised grief. And when I began to do my research, I began about ambiguous loss and disenfranchised grief, I began to realize that one of the big uh, weaknesses in the literature out there is that they really don't delineate the differences between ambiguous loss, chronic sorrow, uh, disenfranchised grief, and, and there's a long, prolonged sorrow. So the list goes on and on. And I realized that really probably my next task should be, and I have a research uh, young woman who's going to be working with me on it, is really to kind of operationalize some of those variables so that you know if some, there is a difference between those, I, and I, I believe there is, and to really maybe operationalize some of those differences in some of those areas. But with that said, this paper was submitted as, on a disenfranchised grief note. And so what my purpose today is to help you, or help me, have you help me determine whether or not this really is disenfranchised grief, or if there's some other concept out there that would better fit uh, some, of, some of this uh, um, experiences that uh, adolescents go through. So I, is this the red button, Chris? No. Right, right button. Right button. So good at technology. <laughs> <laughs> first thing I ask my students, who in here works for ITNs? That's the first, my first thing. <laughs> All right, so the overview, what I'm going to very briefly do, and I'm going to move it along pretty quickly because I really do want to know what you think about it, and is want to introduce the problem, um, why I think it's a problem, what the rationale is. Uh, my a brief, a very brief into adolescent parent abuse, I could talk for days on that. That's what my research has been since back in 1998. I've been doing nothing but focus on this topic. So I'm going to give you the key aspects of that that I think are important to understand in order to understand whether this is disenfranchised grief or chronic sorrow or whatever the case may be. And then defining and applying the definition of what they define disenfranchised grief as and breaking that definition apart and then some of the uh, keys, themes, and assumptions of that concept. And then to really ask, does it answer this question, do victims of adolescent to parent abuse experience disenfranchised grief? Um, I can, again, as I, I, I have no, I have a conclusion I have, I'm curious what your conclusion is. So, my introduction to the problem, um, parents, parents who are abused, experience of loss, of what they perceive their normal family experience should have been, and what currently is. This really hit me one, I don't know how many years ago, maybe four or five years ago, I was presenting at a conference, and I was listening to somebody talk in the, in the presentation, and I had this aha moment, we all have this, and they were presenting something, and they made this passing statement in an aside about um, ambiguous loss, and that these people feel this ambiguous loss, and, and they were describing the situation, and what occurred to me was I had just gotten done talking to some parents, interviewing some parents, and they had mentioned uh, some of those very same characteristics, and I had this aha moment that, and they couldn't put their finger on what was going on, the depression and things they were feeling, and how even though their kids were graduated and gone from school home, they were still experiencing, they were depressed, and all these different things were happening to them, and they just didn't know how to deal with it. And interesting is that a number of my parents had said that in the interviews that I had done over the years, and so that was kind of an aha moment for me. Many of these the parents describe long-lasting feelings of depression and sadness they can't put their finger on, was a reoccurring word that many people said. And because of the stigma of being an abused parent, therefore a bad parent that goes along with being an abused parent, 
they have failed in fulfilling the mainstream, mainstream cultural family narrative, especially if a, a lot of my sample were actually Christian parents who experienced adolescent to parent abuse. They particularly felt like they failed because they didn't meet as a good Christian and having raised their children the way the Bible directs, they shouldn't have problem children. And again, I put this all to the context of adolescent to parent abuse. They're not able to come to terms with this guilt, sense of loss, this grief, this sadness, the isolation they feel, and I refer to this, lingering long after this abusive child has left. Some of these parents I've interviewed, their children are now in their early 30s. Some of them are in their late 30s. Those, that's my, pretty much my time frame there of age groups. But um, they're still dealing with this issue, and it's been 18 years since they've been abused by their child, possibly. And, and it's like it was yesterday. They can't seem to move forward from there. And then uh, a lot of them are questioning themselves that this investment in family, um, that the time of their life that they gave, the energy that they gave, if, and w the few rewards that they've reaped as a result of experiencing adolescent to parent abuse wasn't worth it. And a lot of them are, are, fe are feeling uh, feelings of depression and uh, regret, like maybe I shouldn't have had children, maybe I shouldn't have focused on this, was this a waste of my life and what do I have to show for it? Because, and again, even though only one of their children was abusive, just the impact that it had on them. So therefore, this is a problem, I think, that, that um, people don't know how to deal with, counselors don't know how to deal with it, pastors definitely don't know how to deal with it. Um, even as educators and academics, I mean, how do you ask the questions and how do you research about a topic such as this? And I think what, what these parents really are looking for is they're looking for closure and they're looking for someone to understand what's going on so that they can fix it. They want to fix it. A lot of them end up in counseling. They'll end up on uh, antidepressants or the case may be, but they don't feel like it's been fixed. And I think this is where that disenfranchised grief, grief slash ambiguous loss, now I'm going to leave them big was lost alone, alone and just jump into and disenfranchise grief. So what, why are they grieving? As I put this presentation together and I was going through it, it really, I said to Artie, I said, well, I go, I think what's missing is why are they grieving? And that's something, I mean, I presented it and I was like, what are they really grieving about? And I, I think what they're grieving, and I, and I, have, to, I, I, I have to go back into my research and find this and, and some of the quotes were, but I think they're grieving the inability to engage as a family in these post-abuse years because even because these families have been destroyed by this one child who abu abused the parents and, and there was an impact on siblings. I'll talk a little bit more about that. I think they're grieving the experiencing of successfully raising and getting these children out into jobs or careers and things such as that, but it was more of a functional achievement versus this idea that they're still connected to these children where they have positive memories and positive feelings to um, fall back on. I think they're grieving the loss of prior and continuing family intimacy as a result of adolescent to parent abuse. That's the title for my presentation, we, we Don't Do Christmas. A lot of these families still, even though these kids are 18 years out of the home, between 10 to 18 years out of the home, these families are still not celebrating holidays and, and traditional things. They won't travel on vacation because even though the, the child is no longer abusive, the, the destruction that has been wrought on the family as far as intimacy doesn't happen. So a lot of these parents are, are missing what they should be enjoying and reaping the results of, from that family um, experience. Uh, the years of experience as a victim, being a victim of abuse and an unacknowledged victim of intimate violence. And they, they can't talk about it, they, even to this day, often don't share about it because as an abused parent, you should be a victim. You should be, uh, be able to be in control of that child, in control of that situation. Uh, the, a lack of understanding of what they survived and how they had to survive it, the choices they made, the things they did to survive, and the, the lack of, which relates up to here, the expected reward for raising and investing in a family. So very briefly, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, there's literature out there is what is adolescent parent abuse, and I underline this key part of it, is an ongoing repetitive pattern. We're not talking about little child outbursts, teenage outbursts, things like that. We're talking about abuse. Issues of power, uh, uh, different types of abuse take place. Verbal abuse, phys physical abuse, emotional abuse, financial abuse are the key forms of abuse identified by parents who have abusive children. Um, the worst parents will report will be the emotional abuse, 
Everybody, when you think of adolescent parent abuse, you think of just the physical, but realizing you're responsible for that child and some of the things those children say, do, and the impact that has. I think if it was just physical abuse, parents would have a much easier time moving on. But after years of emotional abuse, that becomes part of their psyche, becomes part of how they feel about themselves and, and how they dealt with their children. I put some quotes up here that you can read just to be throughout this presentation to get an idea of some of the things that some of the participants said and get a feel for what we're dealing with. But um, so it's an ongoing repetitive pattern. Most of these people who experience adolescent abuse experience on average four to five years. It usually starts when a child's about 11 years old and then moves into, there's a pole power dynamic. I talk about this in a lot of my articles and that, but eventually when you get to the end of it, uh, the parents get the power back because legally they can kick the kids out of the house. And, you know, I always used to chuckle because parents would always say, well, just have them, kick the, or have them kick the kids out of the house. Legally, you can't do that as a parent. You can't just kick your kid out of the house. And unfortunately, a lot of churches would teach tough, tough love, you know, just kick them out of the house. Well, parents would leave. Okay, whole different presentation, but that's very interesting. Data collection has been ongoing since, two, since about the year 2000. Um, I started out with my original dissertation, had 20 participants. Since then, it's been ongoing. As I continued the research, I now have 47, an, an ongoing pool of 47 transcribed. I keep adding to it so that the data over the years has built on it and built on it. A qualitative, and we all know how long qualitative takes. Um, in, have continued to interview parents. Um, I'll just say as an aside, I very rarely teach a class at Bethel University when a child or a student does not come up to me and say, you know what, I, could you talk to my mom? Do you know what, could you please talk to, could my mom call you or my dad call you? And that thus my number, 47, a lot of those additional parents have been picked up from students in our classes who are experiencing this in their families. We know that it happens a lot, it happens everywhere. So this is just uh, data collection. All the right steps were done, basically. <laughs> As I wanna make sure I had my thing in line. Okay, so. What's key contributing components of adolescent parent abuse that directly relates to disenfranchised grief? There's a lot of characteristics I could have put up there about this situation, but I think the key things that occurs in adolescent parent abuse that directly causes or relates to disenfranchised grief is one, the parent's refusal to talk about or report adolescent parent abuse. And we know this is true across all forms of intimate violence victims, but it's particularly true for parents um, because many times parents are blamed for their own victimization. And um, results oftentimes in thinking the teen thinks the behavior is acceptable, but what happens, and that's created with these parents, is this veil of denial. Um, this thing of, <clears throat> yeah, it's happening, but I can deal with it, or well, it's not as bad as I think it is, or um, still seeing the very good aspects of their children, even though this child is an abusive child, they still, if you ask them to describe their children, they'll say, oh, he's smart, he's funny, she's this, she's that, and you would never guess that this child was the way they describe him or her as a person um, perpetuating abuse on them. Um, the family systems theory really comes into play in this. Um, abuse, as we all know with domestic violence, doesn't occur just in its own little, little section and without impacting anybody else. But because of, what, of the disenfranchised grief approach, what are these people mourning? The family systems theory becomes even more important in this. Um, the parents are affected by this. Um, the siblings, I, I have research on siblings that I've presented, haven't had time to write up yet. But just hearing the siblings talk about the impact that this has had on them and as, as they face their future, which again, all comes into play when they don't want to come home and do the holidays and things like that. It has, impacted the, uh, has a huge impact on the abuse of adolescents who, once they've left the home, uh, oftentimes, I mean, there, there's, a mis, there's a myth out there that abusive adolescents go on to be abusive. That's a myth. Um, there's no research to support that. I'm not saying they, some of them don't, but the majority of them, they don't. They go on and they get their lives together and they work it out. But you can't take away you know, that experience from your family. And then the family union, again, becomes a whole different thing than what people had dreamed of it being, um, had thought it would be. Um, when they got married, they were going to raise kids and have grandchildren, and all these, this plan of their life never really comes to fruition because of the adolescent to parent abuse that occurs within the family. And again, there's a lot of different things, that, different rabbit holes we could run down just with the information available out there on it. Um, another aspect of adolescent parent abuse is the parent's perception of their role as a parent outside of the family. And this becomes a huge concern for them. There's a really a negative 
parents have had a negative experience with the court systems. In fact, I just read, was asked to review this article, and it, they interviewed seven, seven judges, probation officers, whatever. There were seven people they interviewed, and they were trying to get it published in a journal article. And it was perpetuating every myth that you know about adolescent and parent abuse. And their, and their uh, reference page was like eight references. And I was just like, oh my gosh, you know, it's like, oh my, this could do more harm than good if you think about what, what happened. But because everything that you think about an adolescent, a, 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 a parent who's abused by their adolescent, they were, they were putting out there, like, this is truth based on seven people. And so it was very interesting to, to read that. But they're powerless. These parents are powerless. And if they were powerful, they would be experiencing abuse. And the court systems do a number of things to perpetuate that. Um, they refuse to back down from the conflict, uh, and if they would back down from the conflict, they probably wouldn't be abused. And again, it becomes this power issue. They're good parents. Most of them are good parents trying to do the best that they can. Um, this is a key one here, noticeable exhaustion. After four to five years of dealing with adolescent to parent abuse, they're exhausted. You can but imagine, um, as well as all the other things that they're dealing with. Um, and so oftentimes, they're, they're feeling expression, depression. They're experiencing despair. Again, when we talk about disenfranchised grief, all of these will come into play as we try to apply it. And so based on this family system and this context of family, we see that parents, these are the three, the main areas and categories that they experience stress, Chil uh, siblings experience stress, Il um, abuse yeah. of adolescence, and then the family system. These, these characteristics of, 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 of these abusive Abuse, abused people within this system are the result of adolescent to parent abuse. Um, these aren't occurring just during the abuse in the home, but it's also occurring after they leave the home. These still continue. And that's, again, as we build into what um, the impact of whether or not they experience disenfranchised grief. So these are important to understand that this carries from when they start abusing all the way over into how many years later when they still haven't been able to recover from the abuse. All right, so disenfranchised grief. We were asked for the, the panel or for the, when they were recruiting papers and such, they wanted us to address disenfranchised grief. They wanted us to use the book by DACA, 1989, um, which specifically introduces that one. Um, to, it introduces this topic and then he goes through and applies it to all these different contexts. And so what we're trying to do is where does disenfranchised grief play a role in some of the more contemporary issues and um, maybe in some unique types of situations we never considered it before. Obviously, disenfranchised grief in the context of adolescent to parent abuse um, is not something people have really contemplated before. So I think was one of the reasons the paper got accepted for this, this panel. Um, the definition, this is the definition of disenfranchised grief. And the way I set it up was that the, the words that you see in just regular text type thing are taken from an actual definition. And then where I put in some little Italics and, pro and an asterisk means I'm going to comment on some aspect of adolescent to parent abuse and why I think it fits for disenfranchised grief. So I just want to kind of give you a little step on that. So definition, this is not my definition, this is DACA's definition, is uh, de uh, disenfranchised grief is the result of a loss for which they, the victim, do not have a socially recognized right, role, or capacity to grieve. So there's no way for them to grieve. These socially ambiguous losses are not or cannot be openly mourned or socially supported. And some issues of uh, some of the topics that have come up with this are, for example, have, if a friend dies, there's only so much mourning you're expected to do. If you, if back in the day of 1989, you know, if you had a homosexual, if you were a homosexual and your lover died, you weren't expected to grieve because it wasn't at that point possibly socially acceptable. If your pet dies. Um, if an ex-spouse is one of the ones dies, I mean, there's certain things that we are allowed in our society that is appropriate to grieve and not grieve, and that's what disenfranchised grief is. It's, it's not being able to grieve publicly or openly because our society has not accepted those different areas or people or things to be able to grieve. This is this grief is restricted by, and what I just identified were grieving rules. And the grieving rules um, are, are ascribed by different cultures and by different societies. And so a grieving rule tells you who you can, who you can grieve, where you can grieve, when you can grieve, how you can grieve, and how long you can grieve. And what I found interesting as I was going through it, it does not identify what you can grieve. And that, as far as an event or some sort of relationship. 
And so a lot of this, when we were looking at grieving, was really tied into the actual idea of a death or a loss, and it wasn't really tied into this idea of a situation or a, a context or an episode. And that's where I think it becomes really unique when we start looking at adolescent and parent abuse. Um, the, the bereaved may not publicly grieve because some, some elements or elements of the loss prevent a public recognition. Again, very true when we look at adolescent and parent abuse because there's this veil of denial. And you'll hear that term used over and over by people who do do research in this area um, because uh, parents are denying it, society's denying it, every court system, everybody's denying that adolescent and parent abuse is a valid form of abuse. I say that with a Take that how I say that. Um, it's like, it shouldn't be happening. Um, lack of understanding of the issue. They re people don't understand it, which is why the veil of denial is created. Ignorance of the issue becomes a huge problem with people trying to find closure for what's taking place. And many people are very unaware of the issue for the first time that they ever hear it. In fact, even many parents who are abused, the first time they hear, and when I was interviewing people, I said, uh, I'd like to talk to you about adolescent parent abuse. And they're like, what's that? And I explain it, and they're like, they have this aha moment. It's like, aha. And it's just like this huge relief. You can just see it. Um, come, oh, that's what's happening. And it just helps them provide clarity for it. OK, so when we talk about disenfranchised grief, it occurs in, I have four up there. It's actually three primary ways. But I added another way down there that I think possibly should be included in this. The first way that people, uh, it occurs is that relationship is not socially recognized. The relationship is not. And I just alluded to this, the death of a friend, and I, I list some of the things up there. Um, and, I, and I think adolescent or parent abuse, under this first primary rule of disenfranchised grief, grief fits particularly well, because nowhere in society is it OK to have been a parent abused by your adolescent. We're not just talking about being abused. It's not OK for you to have been a parent abused by your adolescent, meaning you are the one with the problem. And so therefore, that becomes this, this idea of not social, the relationship of, and who you are in this context isn't acceptable in our society. And, um, and I think a lot of it has to do with education, but even for counseling and things such as that, counselors don't even know how to, most of them don't know how to handle this themselves. And there's some like Jerome Price up in, in, in um, Michigan or Detroit, yeah, Michigan, uh, up in some of those areas. He has started to engage the community in solving this problem, but it's, it's very interesting when you think about this. Cultural factors, the religious beliefs that come into play here about raise up a child the way you should go. And they won't depart from it. And when they are old, they always forget the when they are old part. They do not depart from it. Um, and so this becomes even more of a weight upon parents who are being abused who are Christians. It was very interesting once I had a, a person say to me, um, back to she was some big scholar in the field, and she said to me, she said, she said, oh, I, she says, I, I'm, the only people who are abused are, Christ, are Christian parents. And I was just like, what? You know? <laughs> That's a whole different thing. But it was very interesting because she felt like the, the, the guidelines and restrictions of being a Christian parent is what caused these kids to be abusive. So everybody has a reason for it. Nobody just ever understands that abuse happens. You know, it, it's a power. It's a whatever. So it became very interesting. Legal ramifications. Um, parents are held accountable um, for themselves for what's taking place. So nobody recognizes this. So therefore, it's not appropriate to recognize it yourself if you're an abused parent. Um, the loss is not socially recognized um, or is hidden from others. And this is where um, I think after the fact of when these kids have left home, up to that point, a lot of parents haven't been able to talk about it. They haven't been able to share it for a number of different reasons that they give. But parents have lost a, a certain type of relationship that they expected with their children. They expected to be able, um, parents will often talk about, oh, I hear about so-and-so taking all their kids down to Florida for the holidays, and um, I'm jealous, or I, I can't do that. And, and people be like, well, yes, you can, and, but nobody understands that um, they really can't. They don't feel they have that relationship. So even though they wish they could have, they experience this loss of we're not celebrating the holidays, we're not going on vacations together. Uh, we don't go to weddings the way that people should be going to weddings as a family, and, and meeting up and it, it becomes very interesting when you look at um, how this continues to be hidden but yet they have still have no one to talk to about it and so they hide that they are slash were abused parents because again this comes back to that stereotype they're a bad parent instead of being identified as a domestic violent violence victim where they would get a lot more support veil of silencing comes back into play on this many different reasons 
but the silencing aspects of it, if you look at Noel Newman's and some of her research on silencing, um, you, you know a lot of the labels and the things that go along uh, in order to silence people come into play when you see how, um, when you read some of the research that's out there and some of the reports of these parents. The griever is not socially recognized, uh, may, may include those who are not socially defined as capable of grief. Again, this is their definition and then this is mine. Abusive parents are a victim. Um, they're not, because they're not socially recognized as a victim, they can't have these feelings. And so therefore that comes into play about whether they can or cannot deal with the grief of what they lost. Um, abused parents don't exist for most people. It's an anomaly. And if it does exist, the next one will show. I'll address that one as I go on. They're not socially recognized as a good parent. And again, this idea of good parent, bad parent, parent comes into play. We'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, the circumstances of the death that contribute, and this is, this is where I think becomes very important with disenfranchised, uh, disenfranchised grief. The deaths that contribute to stigma and negative judgment by others. We know that with perception, for example, we're much more charitable with ourselves than with others. You know, we think the worst, first impressions make, if you know all those characteristics of perception come into play. Well, this really comes to play when we start looking at some of these things because the circumstances of this is that it's your own fault you're abused. If you were a better parent, if you did it right, if you would have done things differently, you wouldn't have been abused. And so this is where, uh, with a lot of different things in our society, that we blame others for their own misfortunes a lot of times. Or, you know, if you got, if you got mugged, you shouldn't have walked down that dark aisle to begin with. And that's a blame that goes on. The same thing happens we see with adolescent parent abuse. They could have made different parenting choices, its own fault, so therefore, that the circumstances of this, of what they're encountering, of what they're going through, um, is, ne is negatively impacted. And so what do they do? They're silenced, they don't talk, and the cycle continues. So these parents are out there grieving over things that they feel they've lost, but they really have no one to talk to um, in this situation. And realize when we talk about some of the things they've lost, it could be marriages or jobs or you know, relationships. I mean, it's, this isn't a, a small little issue. This is a huge issue that has huge ramifications. This one I think is very interesting. There's a, and these aren't assumptions anymore, but these are some of the themes that go along with this in franchise grief. There's an underlying theme of a stigma or invisibility tied to uh, disenfranchised grief, DFG disenfranchised grief. I just part published, my daughter and I just published an article on stigma management in the Journal of Family Communication, big na our biggest top national journal for family calm. Right, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Pretty proud of it, okay? But parents manage the stigma they spend their lives managing the stigma and narrative of others and their perception of them. And when you look at um, uh, what the article talks about, it, their number one way to manage adolescent parent abuse of, um, of uh, stigma management typology is to be silent. And so again, we're still hearing the silence. It's not that they're not experiencing it, they're not dealing with it, but they're managing the stigma that others have of them. And so how do they go about and how do they do that? So there's this, there's a stigma and this theme tied into uh, disenfranchised grief with these parents, based on previous research, um, is actually uh, supported by what, what we see them and how we see them behaving. Because of the last lack of social recognition, disenfranchised grief is a hidden grief, and this hiddenness increases the reaction to loss. This is where you really start to see parents, this, is, this for me was that aha moment, because these are the things, this section, there's four sections here, this is where I saw and heard parents and I'm like, aha, this is what's happening. In disenfranchised grief, it causes intense emotional reaction, it reactions, it intensifies it. Parents talk about how many years later, they still can't put their finger on what they're feeling. Um, they're depressed, they're going in for counseling, they're getting uh, antidepressants, some of these types of things. They're going through the actual grief reactions we see when people lose people, uh, lose significant others and things such as this. R imagine if you were grieving of the loss of a loved one, a husband or a child or whatever, but you weren't able to talk about it or even to express it. And that's what these parents are experiencing. They can't respond to the abusive teen or the siblings. Um, this is something that, they, that happens in a lot of these families. Um, behaviors that happen is that they'll ignore phone calls, they'll start checking texts, and they find themselves withdrawing from that family, even though they were engaged all those years of abuse. Um, once those kids left and years down the road, they found themselves backing off from these, this family. Because, and they can't, probably can't even tell you why, but they'll know, that, but they'll mention, they'll say, I check who's on the phone. If it's him, I don't answer it. I check the email, it may take me four days to respond to it. 
or even open it for fear of what, what they're going to see. And this is years later. Um, my daughter calls it post-traumatic stress syndrome. She, she wants to do an article on post-traumatic stress syndrome, syndrome and how that impacts the interaction between these. Um, she's a full professor out at Western Connecticut University in relational studies. So I keep referring to my daughter. You might think little, but she's, well, she's pretty little, but anyway. <laughs> uh, this is, but this for me was the issue and the, that was the catalyst for this whole study that the, the emotional reactions these parents were going through and they weren't getting help for it. Um, it can intensify feelings of anger, guilt, or powerlessness, re re resulting in a more complicated grief response. Loneliness for these people were key, was key, and it kind of, these are all kind of related. Um, no, no children, um, they find themselves with what they said, and some of the words I heard them saying were like, I don't have any children. Even though they may have three or four children, they're like, I have no children. And what they're saying is that because of that experience, not only do they not have the adolescent a teen, when well, I'm talking about a level of intimacy, okay, I'm not just talking about impersonal type relationships. They have impersonal relationships, but they've lost the intimacy. And this teen may have chased away the rest, they feel has chased away the rest of the family. So the other kids won't come home if they know that kid might be there because they're angry and they're dealing with their experiences of what they had to go through. And maybe they have closure with it or maybe they don't. But they're checking their emails and they're doing So everybody has the same type of behavior. And so what is this behavior? I would argue that this behavior is disenfranchised grief and loss. Is that there gets to be a point and it progresses over the time period of a year of years and unless they find somebody who can help them identify it, it won't be treated. And so that's why I would argue that it's either disenfranchised grief treatment needs to be done or possibly ambiguous loss treatment needs to be done. Rituals may be absent or the grievers may be excluded from rituals. They don't celebrate holidays or events and they don't mark memories. And that, that's the title. We don't do Christmas. They don't do anything. They don't do Fourth of July. They don't do birthdays. They don't do, a lot of them don't do anything other than send a card or, you know, they do their role as a parent. They're still doing that. But there are no celebrations or holidays or things such as that. <coughs> Which for me, coming from the Midwest, from a big family, is like, that's what you do. That's why you have families, you know. It's like, you have that community and connection. And these people withdraw from that, just to me, disenfranchised grief. The reduced or absent of social support promotes a sense of generalized isolation. There's no social support. What happened to my family? What does the future hold? Nobody can help them answer that question because, for one, they don't, I think they themselves don't know what questions to ask. Um, they know they may know they need help, but when they go in, they don't know how to begin to tell the story. And that's very interesting because a lot of times uh, people will have, well, find it, on average will seek nine different counselors or whatever, on average these parents sought out nine different on average. Um, but still, uh, many times, they're, they're still, they're shell shock. What happened to my family? Um, I don't know how to even, I can't even begin to tell the story because how do you tell the story after years of not telling the story? So what does the future hold? And a lot of them don't know, which is, in my mind, disenfranchised grief. Um, disenfranchised grief may be hidden for years only to be triggered by later losses. There's a lot of triggers that get place, take place, whether it's going to a funeral where someone has passed in their family, whether it's going to a wedding. Um, that's a trigger because they realize they'll never have this big wedding. Whether it's um, going to a funeral of someone uh, they may not have resolved an issue with, somebody who may have made, whether it's related to their family in this instance of adolescent parent abuse or not, they've never been able to set the separate set the record straight, that comes into play. And I think despair is uh, this feeling of despair. Um, and there's triggers all along the way where they find themselves having to deal with this as if it was just yesterday. And that's where this idea of triggers and disenfranchised groups, I think, comes into play. And um, almost done here, uh, these are some of the reactions that, words that have been identified in the literature of disenfranchised grief. Also the same words that identified in a lot of the interviews that I did by these parents when they talk about their feelings and what they're going through. Um, I think that the key one is this idea of depression and this idea of, of uh, despair and anxiety. These three really, oh, and the guilt. The guilt is huge. What could I have been different? Um, I, I think they might be healthier if they could get a little angry, but um, some of them do, the majority of them don't. They just kind of like, okay, now what? Is this all there is? What do I have to look forward to now? So because they're interesting. All right, they blame themselves during the abuse years. They couldn't find help. They couldn't fix it. And then there's no acknowledgement. Again, these are still themes of the disenfranchised grief and then how this fits in with this. I think this is a great quote. And then I'd like to this and show one more thing. I'd like to open it up. Those whose mourning is not 
delimited because its present has not been acknowledged. This is a quote by a pine here about what disenfranchised grief is. And, and he goes, furthermore, it's likely that disenfranchised grievers have difficulty releasing their emotion privately, let alone publicly. And I think that really talks about what these abused parents go through. Um, the road back to an, accept, an accepting society has to be difficult when the group does not even know that a loss has occurred for the disenfranchised griever. This quote to me just sums it up. It just almost makes me want to cheer up a little bit because to, to realize that somewhere or another there has to be some sort of educational, educational awareness. It has to be something that makes people aware that how many million of par millions of parents are experiencing this. It's too easy to say, oh, she's just depressed, or she's just going through this, or he's just going through that, when we don't even, we don't know the back story to a lot of these types of things because you don't talk about it. And that's the key with the disenfranchised group. So I'm going to skip this, but I, I don't know. Can disenfranchised grief be used to explain some? I put the word some, and I, I didn't have some, but as a researcher, you know, nothing's solid. It doesn't include everybody, but I wonder, abuse parents' experiences after their children leave home, and why is it important? Because I think it's so important, like I just alluded to, is that we can't help these parents. And the one, they've been abused for years, and now they're still being in that, in that prison of abuse in a sense. They're not being abused, but the ram they haven't been able to deal with the ramifications of it. And now a lot of them are in their 40, uh, 50s and some of them in their 60s, and they're still dealing with it, what they were dealing with back when their kids were 18. And for me, I find that really sad and really discouraging because a lot of it is just adolescent parent abuse is not socially acceptable and they're not recognized as, a, as an actual victim. So I open it up for questions, thoughts, comments on that. Yeah. So you mentioned they, they have an average nine counselors. Did they get into it all, like how those counselors failed them? Because obviously they weren't very happy with a lot of the counselors they went to. Is it, they, they didn't feel like they were helped. They didn't feel like the counselor could even acknowledge this. I mean, what, what kind of, did you get any, because I'm kind of interested in that, especially your kind of closing point there. Like, what could counselors do better? What do they need to be doing better? Well, I think one of the things, and that's why I mentioned that study that I just uh, referred to, mm -hmm. you know, that where I was just so appalled when I read it. I had all I could do to give a nice review. I'm sure it didn't come across nice. I thought I was being nice. Uh, so, you know, I realized that two of those were judges, two of those were probation officers, two of those were social worker counselors. There were seven participants. Seven part yeah, that, that's it. And hearing what they said, um, so the, the lack of understanding, I think the, the key thing is that, that counselors, whatever, need to educate themselves on this issue. It's not as black and white as people think it is. And there's still a lot of parent blaming going on. We would never blame a, an abused woman for her abuse ever. Um, and if we did, well, everybody would be on that person who did that. I think that's the primary thing is that realize, and that's why I like Price so much out in Michigan. I actually went and met with him. I have a video that we made the first year I came, first or second year I came here called uh, The Color of Hope. And it was kind of to introduce this problem. And he was on the video, and, and he's from the Family Institute up there, and I think he's doing it right. And he says that in these types of situations, it can't just be left with the parents. Uh, it has to be a community involved because obviously these parents are already being abused, so they can't stop the abuse. If they could, they would. They can't. So therefore, he and he gathers coaches and clergies and other people's families, and so there's this whole network of accountability for these kids, and he finds quite a bit of success there. But it, but but you know that's like you know it takes a village to raise a child for these types of children. It really does, or basically you're back to this one-on-one -on -one type thing. So I think where parents felt they failed, a lot of these people failed, was one, they didn't understand it. Two, a lot of it became about uh, parent blaming and here's what you need to do differently. Um, I always had to chuckle because I had, my sample, they were intact families. I mean, they, I think I had a more educated sample, so to speak, or whatever. And I, you know, I didn't have the single parent sample, but Cottrell did up in, uh, Cattre uh, not Cottrell, uh, yeah, Cottrell did up in Canada, and her and I talked. But she she identifies a lot of the same things we do uh, that I did in my in my research, and the, the idea of it is that um, people just don't understand that court systems mandate parent parenting classes, but these parents probably could write the books on it because they've done so much research on it themselves trying to stop it. I'm not saying they're perfect, but I'm saying obviously there's something going on. Three they, on average, my sample had 3.4 children in it. Um, only one was ever abusive. So does that are they a bad parent or is there something going on with the kid? Mm -hmm. Because the other three were good, what we would consider good kids, you know. Um, so there's just such a lack of understanding and rather than hold the kids accountable for what they were doing, 
a lot of the counselors were holding the parents accountable for what the kids were doing. But when you get to have a, a teenager, I mean, try getting the keys out of their hand when they're bigger than you. Try it, and what will happen? I mean, I, you know, I think, of, you know, I'm short. My daughter's little, you know, and so there's just a lot of issues that come into place. Not as Whatever. So I think they were disappointed. They try to put them on drugs, and then they get upset that the parents don't make the kids take the drugs. Well, how do you get a 16 or 17 year old to take his pills? What do you have to do? And if you do anything, kids know that if you do anything to them, this is why I talked about the court system, they dial 911, and automatically police side with the, the child. And I'm not saying that's bad, but I'm saying you have to be realistic of the context of why they're calling, and is that child really being abused as an adolescent, or and when the parents tell you, you know that's not the case, who are you going to believe? I mean, so you can start to see the issues that come into play. And I think parents, a lot of times, of the nine, and that's on average, some went 12, some went 16, some went one or two, and that was it, you know, so it was, they just felt like it was useless that the parents, that the counselors, that they knew more about the situation than the parents did. Right or wrong, that was their response. I, um, I have some experience with this in terms of um, the adoption community. And this is happening when kids are four and all the way up. And um, I was just wondering if that it has shown up in your research that the kids are adopted or if that's not even part of it. Just well, my sample, I made, I, that was a confounding type of variable I didn't want to deal with. So for my criteria, for mine, were intact families, whether that was a step parent, non step parent. Um, Intact families, uh, not, there were some adopted children there, but that was not my, I think I had two adopted kids. Most of them were biological, or they had been step-parented since the kids were, they viewed them as their parents. Um, that was not my sample, although I've heard a lot of horror stories about adoption issues. Not my sample, specifically not my sample, because that would have eliminated them out of my criteria. Much like Cottrell did, her focus was on single parents, single moms. And so she, a lot of our things uh, cross over, but she, she was just looking at single moms, not adopted single moms. So I don't even know if there's any research. I'm sure there is some, but most of it doesn't focus on that. Aspect. That disenfranchised grief also seems to play in. So um, again, in the adoption community. Um, depends on how you get there, but for families that I know and myself included where, um, you know, we really wanted a family and we wanted to add kids, and then you have kids through adoption and there are multiple factors that go in and you end up needing to grieve for the, grieve the kid you didn't have to work with the kid you have. And it's sort of a similar thing. People looking in from the outside will say, well, how can you how can you be upset? How can you be depressed? How can you be sad? You wanted a kid, you got a kid. Yeah. But it's a, so that that made a lot of sense to me from my own experiences. And it seems like from, you know, this is my first, um, you know, the, the adolescent to parent abuse idea is not one that I've heard discussed the way you're discussing it, but the disenfranchised grief makes sense to me the way that you described it. Um, you don't have any else? I'm just curious if birth order is a factor in what child is more likely to be in use of adolescent and also gender. Um, that's a really interesting question. Uh, I never actually looked at that, but just out of knowing my sample, uh, second or third child, there's four, it's the second or third child. Oftentimes, uh, if it's a middle, oftentimes there's three, it's the middle child. Not always, but I would say predominantly that's where it falls here. Um, sex of the child, uh, there's no difference in sex up to, until up to a certain age. Adolescents, um, girls and boys, will, by the time they reach the age of 10 or 11, will start to become abusive. Uh, children, um, because they're getting bigger and more powerful, Boys will continue on to be abusive because they have the strength, the physical, uh, oftentimes. Uh, girls will, who do continue on to be abusive, um, if they do in serious form, will use weapons. So then it becomes a very serious form. 
I had one one of my sample one of my girls. She took actually had, took a hit out on her dad. I had some, paid a guy to shoot her dad. Um, I, that was her form of he found out about it as a whole different thing. But yeah, so primarily, if they continue, the older it gets, it's males. Uh, when look at, they start out about the same. About 13, we'll see the men continue. The boys continue on. Oftentimes, you'll see the girls stop at 13. If they don't stop at 13, you're talking very serious types of abuse with weapons and things like that. And a lot of emotional abuse with girls more than physical abuse. Yep. So what would cause them to stop at 13? I mean, you don't just flip, flip and change, do you? I mean, if they'd been abusive up to that point. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, and that goes back to some of my other research, that you know that the progression of abuse, it gets more serious as it goes on. Mm -hmm. So probably what has happened is that some form, way, or another, there has been some sort of intervention at that okay. point. Realize that it starts as verbal abuse, and then it, if verbal abuse can't be contained, and there not be... By verbal, we're talking cussing, swearing, things like that. And then for a lot of students, it will ne or kids, it'll never get past that point. But then for those who continue to decide to, and I don't know if it's just a, this kid's gonna stop at that age or not, or if something has been done, or if there's been some intervention. But for the kids who then continue on, you start to get the, the physical abuse, and then you start to have the emotional abuse with that. So I don't know if kids just start to drop off because they just realize this isn't smart, or they get involved in other things, or if there has been some sort of things that parents have done to be able to stop it, and that's a really good question, that would be a really good area to look at, what made these kids stop and these kids not. We know, and we even know with intimate violence, domestic violence, if you can stop the verbal abuse, and we know this with even the patterns that have come out with some of the research I've done, if you can stop the verbal abuse, and if that's where they stay, then a lot of parents are like, verbal abuse I can live with. And so they live with, those are those really mouthy kids who swear and cuss at their parents, but they've never hit them, and they've never emotionally abused them. But the, the verbal abuse is still going on, but they just don't consider it this. In my sample, the other thing is misleading. In my sample, they had to have experienced all three forms of abuse in order to qualify for my sample. Um, I missed part of your presentation because I had another commitment, but did you already talk about kind of any more common characteristics between all the adolescents that have ended up being abusive? Like, is there a mental illness usually in there or any other kinds of commonalities? No, there's, a, there's some articles out there uh, that have been done where people try to say who's abusive and who's not abusive. Um, some of the theories that are coming out are, one is this entitlement theory. There's no big theory. Nobody, nobody has applied theory to it yet. It's still pretty young in its research. Um, this idea of entitlement be becomes a, a theory based on what group you're working with. Obviously, some of the, uh, some will argue that it's depression issues in adolescents. A lot of adolescents who get depressed will act out physically and be aggressive physically. Um, drug abuse, drug and alcohol abuse oftentimes will come into play in kids who have a freedom to do it. But there's no one characteristic of it. I mean, a lot of these kids are diagnosed as, uh, what do you diagnose them um, Defiant. Oppositional defiant. Oppositional defiant. And a lot of times they're diagnosed that, um, a lot of these people get diagnosed that because they need to put them under something to get the counseling paid for. So a lot of times that's what they get squeak, squeak under. It may not really be that, but. So there's, there's no common thread based on the samples. You know, single parent, in pad. You know, this is, people know the answer. And that's like the always says, if we knew the answer, we'd, we'd fix it. Yeah. And, yeah. So. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, do, you, uh, do you know of any research or do your research show um, of these children who grew up um, and then got married, if they were abusive to their parent, does that continue in the marriage or the with their in-laws, so, you know, mother, father-in-law, or anything like that? No, the interesting thing about it, and this is where I have another article out or this article there, but it, it has to do with the, the power, the power issue. As kids go on, we know that parents have to start out with all the power and kids have no power when they're little, right? And so what happens is that you see this crossing. Oh, it's in my lectures I do in my abuse class. And then you see the power crossing. And then as kids hit to be about 14 or 15, they realize because of court systems and all these legal things and that, they realize they actually have more power than the parents because of the way our society is set up. And then they get to this point at 18 all of a sudden where all of a sudden the parents now can legally say, I no longer have to keep you in my home. I no longer have to be responsible for you. And then all of a sudden the power like almost overnight drops like this because all of a sudden I can kick you out of my house and no longer have to. So you'll see kids start to become more, those who stay in the home start to become more collaborative with their parents because they have to in order to be able to stay in the home and now all of a sudden it benefits them. 
And so that at that point, oftentimes, a lot of those relationships go on to be repaired. Um, once, the once the abuse stops in adolescence and they've been kicked out and they, these families move on, um, they do develop and they do try to find, they do have a relationship, it's just not the kind of relationship and the close relationship that we would think of I would have with my daughter, for example, if she was abusive. But um, it, 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 because abuse is an issue of power, they no longer have power over these, these people. Now, do they carry out and abuse, I don't know whether they abuse their in-laws or things such as that, but there is, like I said previously, there is no correlation between, there has been then, between adolescents who are abusive and will they abuse significant others. There's just nothing, nothing to prove that. Some people argue that because the, of the theory, the violence begets violence theory. I don't agree with that theory, I don't like that theory, um, but there is some people out there who, who do agree with that theory. There's a number of different theories out there. But it would seem like they would abuse their kids, wanting to have power over their kids. No? I'm not saying there isn't. I'm saying I don't know, and there's no research to support that. It's kind of like saying people who are abused go on to abuse their children. We know that's not true. I mean, there's always a percentage, possibly, but we know that's not a cause of future abuse. So we have to be really careful we make those jumps. I mean, anybody who does abuse, like a lot of us are familiar with it, you just got to be really careful making those jumps. All right, thank you.